but hopefully I'm going to give you some time for questions just at the end. But to start off with, so yeah, if you've got any questions about what I speak about today from the Bible, hold them for the end and we'll have a little chance if I don't go on too long. Uh, I watched a film the other night, it was called The Book of Eli, a um, bit violent in a few places, 15 certificate, but I was amazed because actually it was a, a Hollywood film about the Bible. And really it was a story of two fellas in post-nuclear war United States and there was only one copy of the Bible left called the book of Eli and it was about how these two guys wanted to use it in different ways both of them had power, both of them had strength both of them had means but one wanted to use the Bible as a way to control people so that he could get power over them and to gain for his own ends he was merciless I can't even remember the name of the character he was played by Gary Oldman a very intimidating and scary guy and he managed to get people to work for him, but none of them really liked him. The other guy was this mysterious fellow played by Denzel Washington, and he had power, and he had strength, he had super ninja skills, it was phenomenal. I won't tell you the sort of turning point at the end, it sort of gives the game away a little bit. But he wanted to use his strength and his power and his privilege, not for his own ends, but to bring righteousness, joy and new life to others. And it was interesting, actually, the subplot was there, that actually the, the filmmaker seemed to be sending out the story that, what is obvious to all of us, God's words, which both recognise as powerful, both the baddie and the good that he recognises as powerful, God's words could be used to bring oppression and brokenness or new life and hope. But it was interesting, because there was, there was one girl in the story, and she was sort of like the heroine in it, her name was Shula, and she had been under the influence of the nasty guy who basically controlled her, made her do cruel and wicked things. If she didn't do them, he would beat her or her mother. Um, and if, if, he, if she did comply with what he said, then she would get water to drink, which was scarce. She would be given a roof over her head and she would be protected from other bad guys out there. But it was all on the basis of whether or not she would obey. Contrast that with this other guy, um, Denzel Washington character who, well, there's a point in the movie where she is totally at his mercy. He can do with her what he pleases. And there's a pause and there's a silence because where she is exposed and he can just treat us, trample her down, oppress her, be cruel, he just says, no. She says, what? You see, it's expected that he will. And he says, just take a seat, sit quietly there. And he builds a relationship with her. She's never met anything like this before. And the rest of the story plays out in a really interesting way because whereas before she was under the oppression of somebody who, well, she had to obey to get good stuff out of, she's willing to say, I want to leave that place, I want to leave all that I've known, and she wants to, or rather annoyingly to the Denzel Washington character, she just leaves and follows. He says, go back, go back. No, I want to go with you. Why? What was it? What was it that made her want to change her whole life circumstance, follow this guy, and even by the end of the story, she wants to be like this guy. What is it that does that? You see, a gun and the threat of pain could make her obey, but it couldn't make her want to follow. But she experienced something from that hero type guy that made her want to follow, want to, and even be changed by it. What was it that she experienced? Mercy. Mercy. Mercy is the only commodity in the whole world that can actually change what people want. Other things can make people behave. But the only things that will change somebody deep within is mercy. Mercy can actually, if you taste mercy, if somebody has shown you mercy, it makes you want to give yourself to them. It makes you want to trust them. It's a place of haven. I know that though I am in this person's power, they could conquer me if they wish to, but they deal gently with me and mercifully with me. You want to just... It motivates you, doesn't it? It makes you want to be there. And in the same way, mercy can't leave you unchanged. If you've, if you've had a brush with somebody being merciful to you, it will lead you of one of two ways. It will lead you either to be hardened, I've been near mercy, 
and it's too vulnerable to it, and I'll harden myself and I'll become <laughs> or else actually when you have a brush with mercy what usually happens, what so often happens is that you want to be reshaped you want to be made, you, you want to be shaped by that mercy so some of you have had people who have well, they've been cruel and oppressive to you. They've been, been able to make you do what they want, but they were never able to make you want to do it. And yet there have been people around you in your lives who have just, even when you knew you didn't deserve it, and they could have rained down, conquering on you. They were merciful to you, and it, it made your heart sink, didn't it? And so we see, and we can see these two things in this verse. Let me read it and see whether you can pick them up. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. He says, you've tasted mercy. It makes you want to give yourself away, doesn't it? I urge you, brothers. Not you have to, but look. In fact, it talks about, you know, this is your uh, spiritual act of worship. In fact, that word spiritual means reasonable, logical. So it's the obvious thing, isn't it? Taste mercy, give yourself to it. It will motivate you, it gives you a new motivation. And in verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's all in view of mercy. In other words, let my mercy reshape you, said the Apostle Paul. And so the big question for us today is, have you tasted God's mercy in such a way that it makes you want to give yourself to him, lock, stock and smoke in battle? And that's the motivation, is mercy. And have you tasted mercy in such a way that it is reshaping you? It's making you new. It's transforming you. I suppose another way we could do that, and I'll split it just another way, we could say, okay, put it like this. Number one, why do you do the stuff you do for God? Is it motivated by duty and drudgery? Fear? Is it because you feel he's making you do stuff? Or is it because it's delight? And in the same way, how do you do the stuff that you do? Is it shaped by, well, centred on you, what you set out for, your goals, your agenda? Or is it shaped by that mercy that says, I will give myself for someone else? So that's what is at the heart of these two verses here. This is, this is what it looks like to be Christian, okay? That you're shaped by mercy, you're motivated by mercy. Those are my two titles, they're dead easy to remember. So rather than waste any more time introducing it, I'm just going to dive straight in and say, look, we are motivated, firstly, verse 1, by God's mercy for the believer in him. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now, you need to let this sink in. This is really important, because this is the difference between Bible gospel Christianity and any other thing that you may build your life upon. The order is important. Yeah? If you, in anything else, if you worship and build your life upon something, that's when you get mercy. And anything else, I'll go see, okay, let's say you're a religious person, like maybe you're following Islam or some sort of religious faith on that, and what that says is, if you Give your life, worship, build your life on that, follow the rules, say the prayers, go to the right places. If you live up to it, it will lift you up, it will make you secure, it will give you a future, it will give you mercy. Do you see that? Yeah, it promises you something, it promises you mercy in the end. But if you don't, then you don't get no mercy and you get chewed up by it, you don't get lifted up, it doesn't make you anybody and your future is rubbish. That's in the religious world, but it's the same. Let's say you're not religious, it's exactly the same. And, and you know friends who are exactly the same as this. It could be, sometimes we can worship in terms of a religion, but also sometimes we worship in the way, that, the things that we build our life upon and give ourselves to. It's not just religious, it's other things too. So in secular worship, we're looking for something to build our life upon. We are looking to something that will lift us up, something that will make us somebody, something that will give us and promise us a future. And I tell you this week in and week out, and you know the various things that people give themselves to. I bit the bullet this week. Jane led me in this way. She said, I need to understand EastEnders. She's still a little bit vexed. 
And what happened in EastEnders this week? The club got burned. I flicked on for like 30 seconds. And what was the bit that I flicked on to? It's when, um, is it Peggy? What's her name? Was it? Peggy, yeah. Ba- Barbara Windsor, yeah. Big hair, the whole thing. And it's a big emotional scene when she's sitting next to Phil, her drunken son. Yeah, you remember that scene? And what does she say to him? What has she built her life upon? What was it she wanted? The Queen Vic. She said, it was my pub. And she just, I mean, I wish I'd got a quote of the whole thing. She said, this is my pub and it was a place where I go. And I built my life upon it and that was my big first love. And what happened to the Queen Vic? Gone up in smoke. It's only at that point that she realised that. Because what does she immediately say to her Phil, who's in a right royal state with her marks all over her? What does she say? But you, you're the most precious thing in my life. It's either going to be the Queen Vic for her, or it's going to be a son. And the Queen Vic, Vic could burn down. And when that happens, does it lift you up? Does it show you mercy? No. Well, that son who... Well, we know where the, author, uh, sorry, the writers are going to take that storyline, don't we? Because we know that Phil's not going to end up doing any good. He's going to make himself better for a bit and then crush it. Uh, uh, so all uh, hopes are in him. And is that one going to lift you up? No. You see, whatever you build your life around, you say, if I worship you, which is what worship language means, build your life on it. If I build my life on you, you will give me mercy. But here, look at the order. Because you have received mercy, build your life upon me. You just get it, you don't earn it, it's not a reward for worshipping, but it leads to it. See, in everything else we think we will get mercy by worshipping, but can I tell you, you don't. In verse 1 we see, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. We worship not to gain mercy, but we worship because we've received it. We give our lives over, put ourselves in God's hands. Why? Because we've already got it all. Do you remember early on in the book of Romans, there's been loads of talk about worship, and incidentally, we'll come to this in a minute, it's got nothing to do with singing in the book of Romans, in the New Testament for that matter. In the book of Romans, we've been, we've, we met false worship. Do you remember in chapter 1? That people exchanged the truth of, the, of God for a lie and worshipped created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. you remember that? So we're always doing it there. And when that happens, we try and get those things to lift us up, make us a name, give us a future. But in mercy, in Jesus Christ, what has he done? He has already lifted us up. He said, you are my son and my heir. Which is a cross whether you're a boy or a girl. It's a declaration of a status in the family. You have been lifted. You can't get any higher. And it can't be taken off you. He said, I have made you someone. You will never let me go. You will rule over the nations with my son. That's what he said in the Bible. He said, I've given you a future. I've given you all of that. Now go worship now go give your whole of your life and build every part of it in me. And as you hear something of that mercy that he's already done it for you, do you want to go and say, yeah, no, I'll go back to the Queen Vic and Phil? Oh. You say, yeah. I want to give my life to that. It's so secure. I'm so safe. It's not a reward. And so often we've done our best to push it away, but he's pursued us. And so think of Shula, that girl in that, that film. She just... I want to go where the mercy is. I want my life to be reorientated around mercy. I want to give my life to it. You want him. I want to serve him and I want to be like him. Now that's here what we're being pushed towards. It uses Old Testament sacrificial language, but that's the order and that's the importance. And so this is what I want to do. And just before I move on to the second point, I need to just clear up two things. You've got to give an opportunity to do it. So two things I just want to clear up on this point of how mercy motivates us. First thing is this. I want to ask you again, why do you do what you do? Particularly when it comes to your Christian life. And if your Christian life is all of life, it's all of life, I'm asking you about, okay? So why do you do what you do in your life and in your faith I want you to look at what is not said. It says, brothers, I urge you in view of, what? Brothers, I urge you in view of the guilt you will feel if you don't do it. Is that what it says? 
Brothers, I urge you in view of the love you will lose if you, uh, if you fall and fail. Is that what it says? Brothers, I urge you in view of the disapproval you will face if you don't perform. Is that what it says? Brothers, I urge you in view of the rejection you will taste if you fail. And yet so many, if we're honest, so many of the things that we do and the choices that we make and the reasons that we do what we do is because we're scared of all that. But they're just not there. And some of us are living in that and it crushes us, doesn't it? It's horrendous. It robs you of joy. It robs you of grace. It makes you critical and unforgiving. In fact, if I ever see anybody who's holding a grudge, it's because they haven't got this mercy of God in their heart. You cannot hold a grudge if you get mercy, if that's the biggest thing. And it's possible to be a, a believer who is saved by grace, but are not connected with mercy, and so you're critical, unforgiving, holding a grudge. In fact, guess what Paul's going to go on and talk about all the way through chapter 12. I love it really that chapter 12 is made for us because we're all people, most of us are people who've said, I'm standing for the Lord Jesus but I've got to figure out what that looks like in my relationships. And he's going to show us what mercy will do to the way we relate to one another, to the way we overcome difficulties, frustrations, struggles, our failures, other people's failures, and that's what we're going over the next month. We're going to let this loose, but if you live in that, it's horrendous. So listen, his mercy knows how guilty we are, and yet it pays the sentence. His mercy knows how vulnerable we are to fail, even now, even once we've trusted in him. But Christ's righteousness is how we relate to God. It secures us. Why do you do what you do? What motivates you? Do you make choices that are motivated by mercy? In fact, I've got to drive it just a little bit harder. If you make choices, if you give yourself to stuff, even if it's good stuff in the church or with other people, if you give yourself to serve God even, for any other reason than in a response to his mercy, then it will be nothing more than slavish joy. It will feel good for a while, but really what you'll be doing is earning your own security in your own eyes. You'll be serving yourself and that stinks when it's passed off as serving God. It will flatten you. If that's the reason, then you're just not honouring God. So you see that it's possible to do good stuff in church, but it not honour God in the slightest, because it's motivated, not by his mercy, but maybe by securing or earning something. And you're all looking at me, and, and you go, well, you do that, Steve, don't you? I say, yeah, and I'm, all look, I'm looking at you, and I say, we all do this, don't we? And we've got some repenting to do. Lord, I want to serve you as much as it is humanly possible out of a pure heart. And where does that come? It comes from realising that you cannot serve God like that. You cannot serve God until you realise and take into your life the reality that he has first, and immeasurably beyond anything you can do to repay, he has first served you, have me? You cannot be, verse 1, a living sacrifice... You can't offer your body as a living sacrifice until you realise that he has already and fully and completely and satisfactorily given his body as the ultimate living sacrifice in love to you, for me. I've got nothing to add. Therefore I'm free to worship. I can be motivated by mercy. And if not, perhaps you just need to grab a hold of the gospel for a fresh point now. Do you need to do that? If that's one thing I need to clear up, then I also need to clear up this word here that's worship. In the book of Romans, it's shown us what worship is. Worship is ascribing something, anything, ultimate worth. But when we talk about worship in church, what do we tend to talk about? Come on, shout it out. Sing it. What else? Sorry? Praying. Good. What else? If we're really theologically motivated, we'll say reading the scriptures, which is worship. Right? But those are just expressions of worship, are they? They are worship. If worship is ascribing ultimate worth, one of the ways in which we can do that is by singing. But the big way, interestingly, for the Apostle Paul here is it's by the transformation of what? Your body, your whole, the whole orientation of your life. 
So if you were to ask Paul, well, if you were to ask us and our culture where worship happens, where would we say? Oh, at a footy pitch, yeah, dead right. Or in a church building, wouldn't we? But if you were to ask the Apostle Paul where worship happens, what would he say? Sorry? In your heart, everywhere else in the week. In fact, Sunday mornings when we gather is about us learning to worship the rest of our week, isn't it? Do you get that? But at our times, and this was particularly prominent in the mid-90s going on to the, nearly up to five years ago, there's been a lot of confusion and argument that people think that actually worship is more to do with music or a certain type of musical experience. So I think it's particularly timely that we've come to this passage just to help us think clearly on this because hasn't it been exciting to try different ways of singing and using music? And that's what we're going to continue to try to do in the future. But we need to get our thinking square and straight on this. <laughs> Remember that in religion what you do is you worship to get mercy. And I think that what has happened, because, we, because being able to sing musically and uh, celebrate together is a good gift, it's open to being corrupted, just like our relationships, we can corrupt them, can't we? And so, I think what it's very easy to, well, I'll, I'll tell it autobiographically. Um, there were times when I was just pursuing a certain experience on a Sunday morning. So I tried out several churches that I thought would give me it, because to be honest with you, it made me feel good. I felt more connected to God. I felt that if I worshipped in the right way, I, I would feel the mercy or get the mercy. You get that? A little bit. And I don't think I'm the only person who struggles with that. We, we, we desperately in our Christian lives want to feel that sense of connectedness to God. And sometimes music helps us to express ourselves in the way... That, and it seems like, well, that's just exactly what I've been looking for. So what happens is, we actually say, well, worship is the way to get to God. And then it's not far from saying, well, if singing is how we worship, therefore it is singing is how we get to God. Do you see that? And already we slip back into the religion that says we worship to get mercy. We worship to get to God. No. We get mercy, therefore we worship. So I think music is great. I think it's a wonderful way to express ourselves. I love the fact that we can sing and do that. I love it when we get together in a big, big group. But there have been times in my life when I was asking music, a musical instrument and a choir and the lights and the right mood and the fellow who was standing at the front, I was asking them to do for me what only Jesus can do. Only Jesus can connect me to God. Only Jesus can give me mercy. If it was as easy as just singing and having the right instruments, then Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross with it. So I had wanted a beautiful thing, which it is, to be able to sing and enjoy and praise and be exuberant in that, and I love that. I love to sing. I like to sing, to be honest with you, more when you are around. I feel like that looks a bit better. But this Paul Walls, just through the week, the Paul Walls in this church building don't have to put up, put up with a lot. But I wanted a beautiful thing, but essentially, at that point in my life, it was becoming an essential thing. And as it did, what was that saying about little churches like ours, who perhaps have only got a piano or a bass? What was it saying about churches in, say, a Muslim country who can't sing, otherwise they get arrested? Was it saying that they can't connect to God properly? Were they lacking something? Because it is Christ who connects us to God. So I want to tell you that if Paul, the Apostle Paul was here, he would say, you know, I love to sing. I absolutely love it. And I love to express my praise and adoration. And in some ways it's so helpful to me. But can I tell you that worship is not something that you do in a gathering of people. Or maybe a small subset, corporate worship. But worship, says the Apostle Paul, is what I do out there. When I shape the whole of my life around who he is and what he's done. You see, we do need our love for God fueled, don't we? But it doesn't get fueled by singing a song. It gets it gets fueled by us connecting to God's mercy and letting that enter our mind and our heart and it's that that brings us worship it's that that shapes our life so I want to encourage all of us you know I've said that mercy will motivate us can I just say that I want you to be captured by mercy not music be captured by his mercy that's the big thing and if we do get good music and loud voices. How encouraging! Could be captured by his mercy. 
I want to move on much more quickly. The second point, I want to be done in five minutes to give you opportunity for questions. But I said the second thing that Mercy does. Remember the first one was that it's... The second thing is that it... Sorry, the first thing is that it... It motivates us and then it's... Oh, I didn't know you've got a gift for encouragement you got this morning. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Second thing that Mercy does, and this is primarily in verse 2... Uh, is that it shapes us. Okay, let's read verse 2 together. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Now yesterday we were at the child protection training. For those of you who came, it was, it was brilliant, wasn't it? It was really helpful. But one of the slides, it was talking about behaviour management. Have you noticed that? So when you think of behaviour management, particularly for young people, and interestingly, for seniors as well, well, not strictly speaking, it was some vulnerable end adults, and they'll have another you lot up, but yeah, I think you take you down in a fight. Um, it's sort of about behaviour management, and when we have in, uh, have in mind behaviour management, what do we think of? Giving them a clout. Giving them a clout. <laughs> Stopping them killing each other. Good, this is helpful. Good. What else do we think of when we think of behaviour management? Taking stuff away. Good. What else? Negative stopping, controlling, making sure that you minimise the amount of mayhem that they can, they, they, that they can manage. And that, that's as far as it gets. It's mainly negative on the other end. Yeah? Okay. But according to this, mercy does more. Look again. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Beha- mercy doesn't bring behaviour management. It brings behaviour transformation at a deep heart level. He says, to you, look, don't be fitted into the pattern of this world, which is predominantly trying to get people to just vaguely get along. But be transformed. That word, um, it comes from, you know, we've got that word um, metamorphosis, and we talk about, uh, you know, a chrysalis, and you get some bug thing going into a chrysalis, and it out pops this beautiful butterfly. That's, where, that's what that word transformation is, is identified with, okay? So the Lord is in the business of seeing people like you and me go into sort of a slimy thing for a while and pop out beautiful. Oh, that's only ever that easy. It's like, like, like the owner getting a spray tan or something like that. Amazing, you know, stick her in the booth. Oh, she's beautiful. Lovely. Unless it goes pear shaped, but that would never happen, would it, Fiona? No, that would never go wrong. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, that's right, Rachel, about it. But brilliant. Okay. So it's like, whoa, but not outward version, inward version, inward transformation. And it's mercy. It's mercy that drives it. Okay. Now, I, we need to get this. In Scripture, there's this great... You, you need to say, how does it work? How do I connect to it? Okay? Yeah? In Scripture, there's this, this big overlap where it is God who changes our hearts. It's God who changes our desires and our pursuits. Yeah. So God transforms us and he transforms and reorientates our hearts so we love him and it's mercy that cracks it. Um, we're controlled by our hearts. Our hearts decide the direction that we're going to go. It, our hearts direct what we're going to worship and what we're going to stand on. It shapes our affections and our actions. And we know that in the Gospel, God grabs a hold of our heart and changes it. But look! Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your Mind. I thought it was all about having my heart changed. Now you're talking about mind. Yes, the heart is the transforming element in your life. That's up to God, and only He can do it. That takes a great deal of pressure off me, excuse me, as a pastor, because I can't change your heart. Okay? But my responsibility is to get the stuff into my mind. My responsibility as your pastor is to get mercy into your mind. So what is it that the Lord uses to transform your heart when he gets mercy into your mind? Nathan said something profound and wonderful the other day. We were talking and reviewing last year and he said what it was like living in our household and he said one of the most helpful things that he found was that uh, was when we get up and sit around the breakfast table and argue and squabble and then when we got that out of the way we open the Bible and we try our best to struggle on through despite the fact that some of us are usually nasty and grumpy we try our best to, to reason it from the Bible 
And later, I can't, I've got to try and quote him exactly because it was just gold what he said. He said something like this, well, I wouldn't want to turn into a legalist. I'm like, oh dear, here we go. But why the monkeys, you'd want to start your day without opening the Bible, you'd be absolutely mad. Is he right? Of course he is. Because what's our job? Get mercy into your mind, and that's all what opening the Bible in the morning is about. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts. Getting mercy into your mind. Get mercy into your mind so that the Lord, by His Spirit, can come and do a work of changing your heart. You see that? What can break our stubborn hearts? It's mercy. But if you shut your ears so you won't let it into your mind, don't wag your finger at the Lord. What can break us down? It's mercy. It will melt you and the Lord uses it. So what we end up with is something other than behaviour management. So, I've got a little task for you here. I'm going to give you an example. Behaviour management says something like this. Stop cheating on your benefits and your tax returns. Yeah? That's behaviour management. Stop it. But what does mercy say? That's what behaviour management can do. Stop doing this and do that. But what can mercy do if it goes into your mind and then the Lord uses it in your heart? I'll give you the example. Stop cheating on your benefits and your tax returns. Mercy says, I want to swap that to learn to share with those who are in need. Do you see that? Do you see mercy does that? It's not behaviour management, it's behaviour transformation. So let's try another one. This one you can have a go at. Avoid being bitter to those who wrong us. That's behaviour management, isn't it? But what's that if you speak mercy into that situation? What in the end will that look like? What's behaviour transformation? What will you do? You won't just stop being bitter towards those who've wronged you. What will you do? If you taste in mercy, what will you do? Love your neighbour as you love yourself. Go on, what else? Good, that's it. See, law can't make you do that, can it? Mercy can, what else? What else will it look like? Show them mercy. So what you will do is, take rather than just simply stop being bitter towards somebody wrong, wronged you, you will actively forgive them and pursue their best good. And if the opportunity presents itself, you will move towards them, not in bitterness, but in love. Now only mercy can make you do that. Here's another one. Okay. Perhaps just, uh, you know, you, you pray, uh, this is what behaviour management says, it says, pray that I would overcome my violent temper. And it would go. But what does mercy say? I'll give you a clue because the time's short. Mercy says, I will lay aside my violent temper and I will go and Lord would you help me to be filled with your compassion and your kindness so that that is my first instinct rather than rushing out. And that's what mercy does. It transforms us at every level. So I want to encourage you, and I think this is what we're being told here, this is the new transformation. We're no longer being conformed to behaviour management, but to a new model of living. You can look it up in chapter 6, I haven't got time to take you there as, as the model of it. I want to encourage all of you, turn it to mercy. Turn it to mercy. This was an old, uh, a guy from a few centuries ago, he gives you an example of what it looks like. I love this, I want to read this, because it's just, it's so simple and down to earth. Again, let a tradesman but have this intention, and it will make him a saint in his shop. So he's probably talking about like a, I don't know, a blacksmith shoeing horses or something like that, or a baker, something like that. Uh, his everyday business will be a course of wise and reasonable actions made holy to God by being done in obedience to his will and pleasure. He will therefore consider not what arts or methods or applications will soonest make him richer, and greater than his brothers, or remove him from a shop to a life of state and pleasure, he will consider what arts, what methods, what application can make worldly business most acceptable to God, and make a life of trade and a life of holiness, of devotion and piety. This will be the temper and spirit of every trade. He cannot stop short of those degree, these degrees of piety whenever it is his intention to please God in all his actions. Do you see that? He's just taking his simple job and saying, I'm going to turn it to mercy. I'm going to use it for God's glory and for other people's good. So will we make sacrifices? Yes, we will. 
But mercy helps you figure out what sacrifices in your life will look like. Sacrifices are not just for the sake of it. Sacrifices in your life are not just because, well, we're supposed to suffer, aren't we, so I'm just a masochist and I'll be nasty to me. No, no. Mercy sets us the shape of the things that we do, the sacrifices we give. They're, for, they're, they're to glorify God's grace in Christ and they are to serve others. That was, that's what mercy will do and that's how mercy will shape us and that's what we're going to find as we move through chapter 12. Mercy is awesome. Are you letting it loose in your life? Mercy motivates and it shapes us. It brings us to worship and it makes us look totally different on the inside. So let me ask you today, please, just as I finish in two minutes, one minute, give yourself a worship and change diagnosis this morning. Are you struggling to worship? If you are, there's an antidote and it's not better musicians and it's not better music. It's put God's mercy in view into your mind more. It's easy, isn't it? God's mercy, is it in view? That's what he says. Brothers, I urge you, in view of God's mercy. In other words, put it in view. Or if you made somebody else, God to be somebody else who's not merciful, could that be a danger for you today? You've made God to be merely the moral arbiter who's disapproving of you or merely a life coach whose job it is to help you get what you want. If he's either of those things or anything else other than mercy, you have got wrong, God wrong, and no surprise that you find it difficult to celebrate in every area of your life, including in corporate gathered worship. So that's the test for you. It tells us that the first and only way that we relate to him is through his mercy. Is that how you think of God? Now this song is a great song to help us focus it, put it into our mind, dwell on it, taste it, put it in view. This is the song that we're going to sing. Some of you have asked to sing this one. I'm not surprised. It's absolutely great. And can I just encourage you, as we sing, realise that his mercy is already available to you. You don't earn it, cook it up or otherwise. So as you sing it, let it shape the whole of your life. That we might be motivated and shaped by God's mercy. What a great song. Let's stand and sing together.